Uh, the brief uh, provided to me as president in this uh, particular speaking engagement as president of the International News Media Association, and I might just say for those who don't know what INMAR is, INMAR is really the trade organisation globally that represents publishers from 70 different countries around the world, all of the, the biggest names from the New York Times to the Narrabri Courier down here. Uh, and, um, and we have 10,000 members, and a lot of the people in this room would be members. But my brief uh, was to inform, to stimulate new thinking and build confidence in the future of news media brands, perhaps even to rally and embolden. Uh, easy enough? Well, yes, and, and no doubt no. With the kind of experience and expertise in this room comes the authority to express strong, often divergent views about our industry's future, about what needs to be done to secure it. No single view prevails, and I look forward to catching up with many of you to hear your own thoughts, robustly held, no doubt, throughout the conference. We may differ on various views, but there's one subject on which this industry stands united. There's no one here who does not understand that when it comes to journalism, what we do matters. It matters a lot. Because what we do, the decisions that we make, affect people. Vast amounts of people across the communities that we represent, people from all walks of life, and our commercial partners too, who rely upon us for growth. Without these people, we don't exist. But we also represent all those people who never read our publications, who never log on to one of our news sites. Such is the role of news media, that its influence extends well beyond its audience in a way that is uniquely purposeful. Over the past decade or so, our industry has rethought the nature of the pact that binds us with our audiences and our clients and our communities more broadly. Let's consider just for a moment how to view our recent past and the many, many challenges and changes our industry has been dealt. There's some who probably still can't pass, get past seeing our industry as one that's been disrupted, one thrown into disarray and decline, like an industrial Samson losing his golden locks. But this disruption story ignores the industry's response, our resilience, our successes, and it misunderstands the nature of the disruption. Consider what we already know. We're engaging more deeply with our local communities. We're building new audiences across more platforms than ever before. We are, in fact, globally, finding entirely new business models to fund journalism. We've done it out of necessity. The old economics of our business don't work anymore. Uh, but we've also done it out of an increasing appreciation for what our audience, our customers value. The economic underwriting of journalism has forever been advertising. But with big digital platforms hoovering up the vast bulk of advertising dollars and the imbalance in bargaining power growing, harm is being done to news media. Well, that's not only a bad outcome for our business, but I'd argue for a bad outcome for society as a whole. Google recently positioned themselves as a force for good, claiming they generate billions of leads to our news sites. And that begs the question, why then are we here talking about new funding models? The fact is, the incredible relationship between classified advertising and journalism, which sustained our industry for so long, is gone. And now, the non-classified advertising that remains is also threatened by the enormous and uncompromising power of the digital duopoly. Both advertising and journalism are still here. They're no, just no longer joined at the hip in the way that they were. Increasingly, the advertising news publishers sell will not even be directly related to the journalism they produce. So, as we become less reliant on advertisers to fund journalism, we become more reliant on consumers to pay for it. This puts the onus on us more than ever to ensure the content that we create is worth paying for. In some respects, this presents an opportunity. I say journalism is going to get better 
as we come out the other side of this transformation. I say this because I can see a new world of data that is empowering our journalists and editors across the globe to better understand and deliver upon the wants and needs of their audience and increasingly their subscribers. So if we think of this as transformation rather than disruption, then suddenly things perhaps don't look so bad. The clouds start to part and hey, the sun's still shining. And that allows us to start thinking about the next decade and beyond. Today, I'm going to discuss six mega trends that I see playing out internationally, though differently in different markets. Together, they show us trusted journalism not only never went away, but all of the ingredients needed for it to gather pace are now in place. These ingredients, the herbs and spices, are not exactly secret, but I would say that they are not consistently understood. Considered as a whole, they not only make up today's media landscape to a greater or lesser extent, but they form a foundation for the future and show how far we've moved from even our recent past. In some respects, nothing has changed and in others, everything has. The contradiction in our case is that the audience remains our first imperative, but how we monetize that audience is changing in every way. Monetization metamorphosis is the first megatrend facing our industry globally. This evolution, and I won't object if we want to call this a revolution, is best characterized by the fact our businesses were once largely built on that symbiotic relationship between advertising and journalism. That relationship has gone through a tectonic shift and the plates are still in motion. Consider that historically, advertising accounted for about four-fifths of revenue and, consum and consumers accounted for about one-fifth. For many mastheads around the world, a 50-50 split is now more typical, while in other cases, the ratio has reversed entirely and consumer revenue is now dominant. Expect this trend from advertiser to consumer to continue. Shortly, I'll talk about how we can better leverage the increasing willingness of consumers to pay for quality news. And although our reliance on print advertising dollars will continue to lessen, all is not lost. The industry as a whole has not won the war against last click attribution, but in some individual battles, advertisers are returning to print. The industry as a whole needs to do a better job of re-educating advertisers on the benefit of the full purchase funnel and not just that last click. At a time when advertising has atomized so extensively, the options available to talk to a market en masse are more important than ever before. Newspapers remain one of the best vehicles to deliver mass awareness and consideration of a brand. This is illustrated best in regional markets where it's not uncommon for the local paper to still be read by more than two thirds of the adult population each week. After all, it's the only source of local news in these communities. As an industry, we need to continue to demonstrate the benefit of professionally generated news uh, media content in both print and digital channels. Digitally, we need to demonstrate the value of highly engaged quality customers that contrast to a dirty web full of user-generated content, dodgy data and passing traffic. So while advertising remains critical, the fact is that journalism of our future will increasingly be consumer funded. Users will have to pay and that's why trust has never been so critical. So let's consider truth and trust, journalism's lifeblood, two sides of the same coin and trend number two. Ironically, in this case, fake news on social and search has in some ways been our friend, making trust our competitive advantage. Truth and trust are integral to our reputation, always have been. The very idea of fake news draws a neat line between those committed to journalism, the real thing if you like, and the rest, the fakes. Because journalism is backed by facts, by research, and of course, the truth. 
That's facts, not fakes. Advertisers earn the trust of consumers also by the company they keep. And media earns trust with advertisers because of our journalism, the value of our brands and the fact that our measurements are real. And yes, we're human, and that means we don't always get it right. But we acknowledge it and we're accountable to our audiences and our customers. We respect the fact that trust is hard to earn and easy to lose. In my research fellow, Gregores, or Greg, which is easier, Piacotta, argues that we're selling journalism, not content, and there's a big difference. Australian, uh, Australian industry body, News Media Works, this year surveyed 1,400 Australians and how they viewed trust across the media spectrum. It found news media is the most trusted media by consumers. News websites, it said, are the most trusted digital platforms. Newspapers, well, they've not only defied countless incorrect calls that they're at death's door, they emerged as the medium with the most trusted content and the most trusted ad environment. This is a global phenomenon. Is it any wonder that we are seeing increasing use of news media by challenger brands, by online brands, where established champions of industry are increasingly talking to their existing audience on owned and social channels? Challenger brands are using the trusted environment of news media to gain a foothold. And social media, well, it scored lowest on all trust measures. And we're all familiar with other studies like the Edelman Trust Barometer, which has shown how faith in the social platforms is faltering as traditional uh, media, and, and in particular news media, enjoys an increase in trust. That's because our, our business is based on people and their communities, not impersonal algorithms. Our people cover the court cases, attend horror crime scenes, sift through mind-numbing hours of political and commercial debate and wrangle with bureaucracy to find the stories that matter. Telling the stories that we would never hear, read or see because there's someone who doesn't ever want them to be ever read, heard or seen. For our people, this can involve great personal risk. The Global Conference for Media Freedom this year made clear the threats many in our industry face. Even in robust democracies like Australia, where journalists from two organisations, including the one where I work, are confronting potential criminal charges for doing their job. Of course, we also tell stories that everyone wants to hear. The stories that champion the heroes who live unsung in the same communities that journalists, not those impersonal algorithms, have shared their entire lives. We exist in lockstep with our audiences. Our children attend the same schools. We buy weekly groceries at the same supermarkets. We barrack and boo for the same sporting teams. We grieve and we celebrate together. It is common across the globe that truth and trust will continue to be core to the value consumers place in us ongoing, providing we continue to build that trust. And for our advertisers, it's up to our industry to continue to demonstrate the importance of the company you keep. The trust we have established with our audience is the cornerstone of a relationship in which our customers increasingly pay and stay for their news. This is our next mega trend. A transformation that is not before time. In this country, we have seen the improving economics of a subscription model offset the declining economics of an advertising model, where today we find the value of a subscriber page view to be approximately 20 times the value of an anonymous browser in our local mastheads. To get those types of incremental benefits though, our challenge is not just to get the customer to pay, it's, it's essential that they stay as well. This mega trend is no longer new, but the nuances are changing as we are learning more about the economics of our content. A quick reflection on the last decade has seen a difficult and drawn out translation of our business to the subscription economy. It has been a challenging journey, most importantly because when we began, we gave our content away for free online 
whilst charging incre increasingly more for print. Weaning our audience off free digital has not been easy, and across the world it has taken time and an evolution of pay models. From metered paywalls designed to encourage sampling and protect ad dollars while data is collected, to hybrid paywalls that mixed a metre with a hard paywall where the most valuable articles were locked all the time, to freemium models which did away with the metre but in a more sophisticated sense recognised that some content was scarce and should be locked for everyone while other content was ubiquitous and best left unlocked and available for sampling, to the most sophisticated dynamic paywalls that are now becoming more and more common like that operated at the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere across the globe. These paywalls are making individual decisions fueled by artificial intelligence on the propensity of an, uh, uh, that, that the customer has to describe, uh, the propensity of a customer to subscribe before determining how much content to give to that customer for free. In doing so, these paywalls are optimising ad revenue and consumer revenue and increasing the chance of conversion to subscription by maximising trial. Combined with increasingly sophisticated pricing and promotions, publishers around the world have been consumed by establishing a paid subscription relationship with their customers. In the world of news media, it's the Nordics that have shown us the way forward. If we look at what's happening in Northern Europe, the Reuters Institute's digital news report in 2018 found that 34% of Norwegians paid for online news last year. In Sweden, 26% and in Finland, 16%. Greg Piacotta from Inmar has labelled these high rates the mystery of Scandinavia, but equally recognises that it may have something to do with the strong historical consumption of print news media in that region. Others related to the fact that Western social and search platforms took a lot longer to take hold in this part of the world. Regardless of why the Scandinavian conversion to digital subscribers is so high, it is no coincidence that Western news media is regularly looking at the advances that these countries are making in areas such as content economics, content personalisation, content marketing, newsroom design and audio innovation. Publishers now understand the importance of establishing large subscription bases and when established they have quickly shifted their attention to retention. And the biggest trend related to retention is recognition that more than any pricing strategy or loyalty program, those customers that read more stay longer. In our business we see a strong correlation between engagement and churn. It is so strong that in our business, bringing members back to our content just one extra day each month reduces churn by one percentage point. Publishers are pulling old rabbits out of the hat and developing new tricks too. Have you noticed how newsletters uh, are breeding like rabbits? Boom, boom. Newsletters across a mass of niches Newsletters can be lifestyle focused, dedicated to sport or public policy, or to any number of special interest categories. Canada's The Globe and Mail recently noted its portfolio of 28 newsletters for one masthead. From the mass targeted such as breaking news to what I can only describe as a very niche publication like their weekly newsletter dedicated to all things cannabis. Newsletters like alerts, Twitter posts, etc. <coughs> are increasingly a deliberate strategy to retain customers through engagement. One of the new tricks is personalisation. The increasing sophistication of directly engaging and personalising journalism prompted Singapore Press Holdings' Fiona Chan to talk of the market of one. The idea takes us as far as you can get from the old model based on print circulation, classified advertising and broad audiences. Perhaps more importantly, it also takes the fine-tuning of data and analysis to another micro level. Globally, this is where artificial intelligence is playing an important role to determine your news feed, your newsletter, your news alerts 
and your next best article recommendation, the market of one. Balancing the importance of editorial curation with the importance of personalisation is a challenge each company globally is approaching differently, but where there is agreement is that both are important. It may also mean that media companies need to help their audience develop new habits, what Inmar's CEO Earl Wilkinson has called creating a login culture. Creating an environment where our subscribers are always logged in and part of the news conversation with their most trusted brands. The lack of a login culture helps explain, despite the clear fact traditional media is the most trusted, advertisers still choose to plug in to demonstrably untrustworthy channels. This will need to change. By producing and surfacing more relevant and engaging content, by improving our customer experience, by reinforcing habit and encouraging a logged in state, and by thinking of journalism as a service rather than journalism as a product, global news media organisations are responding. By doing all of these things, publishers will reinforce a pay and stay virtuous circle, one where the revenue generated is regular, predictable and in excess of advertising. Greg Piacotta, again from Inmar, has also said the transformation from managing products to managing consumers can't occur without the entire organisation embracing the cause including those toiling away in the engine room of our businesses, the newsroom. Empowered editorial is our megatrend number four. The good news is that newsrooms around the world are changing as they combine the razor-sharp news instincts with data science. Our news hounds of yesteryear are transforming to complement newfound content science with their long-held news instincts. I've no doubt that if a reporter time travelled from as little as a decade ago, they'd find much that would be familiar in today's newsrooms, but I am certain that they would find much that is unfamiliar. Yet it's likely that the changes are in their infancy. Or as Earl Wilkinson said a year ago, we are just entering second grade when considered in a range between kindergarten and a doctorate. He went on to suggest that adopting what he refers to as content economics involves peeling back the mysteries that have been buried in print for centuries. And we also need to peel away and confront some of the myths that have sprung up at the same time. Today, data empowers editors and reporters to better know what stories to cover, how to cover them, when to run them, and how to market them. Data is making journalism that's digital, print, broadcast, audio, better because we are giving our newsroom insight they could have only previously guessed. At my organisation, we've introduced a data analytics tool called Verity. Verity is now on the mobile phones of journalists and editors in every newsroom. Verity is designed to empower our newsrooms by bringing them even closer to their audiences by showing them what stories are being paid for in real time. Verity shows our journalists which of these stories are so good that they, uh, they persuaded their reader across the paywall to become a subscriber. Verity shows how many existing subscribers are reading that article as well. It's only one of the measures that we use. It's the quantitative measure balanced by qualitative measures, but it is an important measure. Verity also shows our people how content marketing improves performance so that they can get the most out of the article. This again empowers journalists and editors to improve their SEO, uh, to improve their Twitter technique, their alert and newsletter technique and more. Every action is capable of delivering readers, more subscribers paying and staying, and every action is measurable. This focus on data-informed journalism demonstrates that content that works is the very antithesis of clickbait. Sure, in helping to generate some short-term advertising revenue, clickbait might work in the short term. But for a news business that trades on trust, no way. Clickbait lives on a different planet from quality journalism. Interestingly, put the term clickbait into your internet browser 
and you get a def definition that says clickbait is a form of false advertisement with a defining characteristic of being deceptive, typically sensationalised or misleading. This does not lead to subscription. The benefit to journalism of this focus on subscribers is clear. In fact, the Boston Globe's Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Mike Resendez, played by Mark Ruffolo in the 2015 movie Spotlight, says subscription revenue is more important than ever before. While not addressing it explicitly, his words show the critical role subscriptions play in justifying the investment that media companies make when funding areas such as the time-consuming, at times expensive pursuit that is investigative reporting. In his case, the Globe's spotlight team. Mike went on to say, <clears throat> we can see for a verifiable, measurable fact that people are subscribing to the Boston Globe because of spotlight stories. Now, if these words from one of the world's top investigative reporters aren't cause for optimism, I don't know what is. Journalists and editors will have more and more tools at their disposal to understand their audience. Already, newsrooms around the world are increasingly looking like NASA mission control. In this new space, art is being blended with science. Data will never replace a journalist's or editor's judgment. After all, it is human intuition that separates us from the algorithms and filter bubbles of social and search. But without any shadow of a doubt, data will increasingly inform our intuition and improve our ability to serve our audience. One thing the data is telling newsrooms around the world is that local is the hero. It's one reason why we are starting to see a resurgence in local community news. The, this fifth megatrend shouldn't surprise anyone. Call it what you will, the town square, the parish pump, or hyper-local, it's where the stories that affect readers come to life. And local news is attracting new players internationally from the big end of town looking for a bigger slice of the pie, down to local communities wanting to reclaim their voice. Anecdotally, the trend may become the strongest in communities where big media beat a tra tactical retreat in the pursuit of cost efficiencies. I believe there's even a term in the US to describe this, a news drought. As with, as with life on the land, it reflects the fact that the economics of local markets can be brutal. In this case, local ad markets. Local advertisers want local audiences, but, but today there's many more options for advertisers other than their local paper. Well, in Australia, we understand that droughts come to an end, and clearly social media failed to bring the rain to these communities. But digital journalism and established media companies may be shaping up as the white knights. In the case of News Corp, our highest growth digital mastheads are those in regional Australia. Local is lucrative because the content is scarce and valuable. Recently, I've returned from Gympie, Townsville and Cairns in Queensland. In each of those markets, we have more journalists than anyone else. And almost two thirds of these communities read our printed paper every single week. Our journalists are laser focused on generating stories about local sports, local schools, local personalities, local business, local crime. For any advertisers in the room, may I also mention you might also be underestimating the value of local news. It is remarkable that regional Australia represents only 10% of advertising spend in this country, yet closer to 40% of the population lives in these areas. But I digress. In the US, the Boston Globe has generated terrific excitement and subscriptions through the simple but bold act of hiring three reporters, just three, all locals, with decades of shared reporting experience to cover Rhode Island. This in a market already featuring six daily newspapers, all for a population of a little more than a million people. Globe editor Brian McGrory said this one uncomplicated idea generated hundreds of new Rhode Island subscribers all before launching. The hyper-local model 
also underpins the digital-only Patch News Network in the US, which has about 1,200 local sites generating about 20 million in revenue. It's an idea alive and well here in Australia too. News Corp Australia has recently launched 11 digital-only community mastheads. Each of these mastheads will deliver regular local news content aligned with the state metropolitan paper and will be more profitable after the investment of new journalists. That's one investment I'd love to talk more about, but there's another that has undoubtedly attracted more attention. That's the $125 million acquisition of Australian community media and its 160 regional and rural mastheads. Former Fairfax and Domain executive Anthony Catalano and his investment partner Alex Waitzlitz, I knew I wouldn't get that right, have made it clear they've not bought a bunch of old newspapers and that they plan to grow the business, not shrink to greatness. Hyperlocal is trending in New Zealand too, with new mastheads such as the Papamoa Post popping up. The Post is a solo operation launched in March by a single local journalist, Ellen Irvine, to service Papamoa, a fast-growing suburb in the Bay of Plenty. If Catalano's play represents the big end of town, then Irvine shows how hyperlocal is equally alive at the grassroots too. I'm sure you'll all know of other examples, but what unites uh, all of these efforts is the belief, the sure knowledge that local news matters and that strong local journalism can help underpin new growth and a firm financial future through subscriptions. And it also highlights the conundrum that unites the biggest brands with the smallest, that advertising, especially in smaller markets, is no longer enough to pay the bills and that we need to find consumer models that are sustainable. One of the fastest growing trends, the sixth mega trend and final one, is radio's return, or to use today's parlance, podcasting and on-demand audio. Audio is accelerating. It's already produced some extraordinary long-form journalism from the original long player in Serial five or so years ago by This, uh, this American Life, through to News Corp's very own Teacher's Pet and Who the Hell is Hamish. The numbers, as I'm sure many of you know, are encouraging. Norway's Afton Post in last September launched the podcast Folklart, which I'm told translates as Explained, where journalists report a particular news story in great depth. The original daily audience was 10,000, but three months after, it hit 35,000. Already in America, according to Inmar, more than half of the population has listened to podcasts. And according to PwC's Entertainment and Media Outlook, revenues will exceed globally $1 billion by the end of the year and grow to $1.4 billion by 2023. On that basis, I'd say the early signs are promising. Smart speakers are exploding in popularity and there's estimates that more than half of all podcasts are already listened to in the home. Not to mention Inmar research, which shows 80% of podcasts are consumed all the way to the end. Their audiences are younger and they are more affluent. The revenue that's being generated from this audio acceleration is largely today advertising based. And at some point not too far off, the industry will no doubt extend to a paid content model. Spotify's acquisition of Gimlet Media points to this. And this again is the nub of the issue. It's what defines our time that advertising will not cover the cost of journalism, so we must seek ways to monetize it directly from consumers. As audio does accelerate, we will no doubt reflect on our experiences with text-based content to ensure that we don't make the same mistakes again. It's important this time around to begin with the end in mind and learn quickly from new models uh, emerging in the market. <coughs> what is for sure is that the business we're in today is a lot more complicated than ever before. I hope that my thoughts today help distill the issues, even though I don't claim to have all of the answers. One answer I do have, though, is that there are groups like the one I'm here representing today, the International News Media Association, which can help. There's plenty of Inmar members here today, Seven West Media, Nine Entertainment, Australian Community Media, McPherson Media, 
my mob from News Corp Australia, uh, uh, Narrabri Courier, I think, is a member. Um, there may be more. For all of you, you are individually eligible if you're part of one of those organisations to become an individual INMAR member and you can access their vast repository of resources. If any organisations here today aren't members, I recommend it and come and talk to me later. Also, please stay tuned in coming days for the launch of the new 2019 INMAR Digital Platform Initiative Report the global analysis of the impact that the digital platforms are having on publishers is compelling reading. In fact, it was written by Australia's very own Robert Whitehead and helps decode the issues for publishers and considers strategies we should all consider in dealing with platforms across the globe. Again, the release is imminent. I'll leave you with a final thought. I reckon that there's seriously never been a better time to work in our industry whether it's in a newsroom, in sales, in marketing, or in our digital product teams. For one, our relevance has never been greater. Our reason for being and the case for mass and independent news media never so strong. It is a noble cause and we are fighting a good fight. I would also say that the path ahead is clearing. It wasn't always so. 10 years, even five years ago, we really were stuck in a dark place in the middle of the woods the economic model wasn't clear. The sustainability of journalism in our communities was not clear. Well, we're not out of the woods yet, but at least we can see the forest's edge. Media organisations are returning to profitability and returning to revenue growth. The sus subscriber model is working. Revenue sources are diversifying. Take the Australian, for example. It now has more digital subscribers than it ever had in print circulation at its peak. And where prestige titles like the Oz go, may the rest soon follow. We know the trend is with us. The winds are finally starting to blow our way. Fulfilling that promise is the task that lies before us all. Thank you very much. <laughs>